Napoleon Bonaparte, born on the small island of Corsica, is one of the most famous men to have ever lived, hailed as the man of the 19th century. Even his very name is used as a word to describe something momentous, colossal, Napoleonic. A rags to riches story, Napoleon was only 24 years old when he became a general, and 35 when he crowned himself Emperor of the French. Charismatic leader of men, shrewd politician, and a military genius, Napoleon fought 60 battles in his career and only lost seven of them, making him the most victorious general in history. Not since the days of ancient Rome and the Caesars had one man conquered so much of Europe or held so much power. As a ruler of France and its empire for nearly 15 years, Napoleon was also a reformer and improver. He played a leading role in solidifying the gains and ideals of the French Revolution, promoting equality and careers open to talent, securing religious freedom and tolerance, ending aristocratic and feudal privilege, and founding the Civil Code, a unified and progressive code of laws, which are still in use across Europe to this day. Napoleon's empire helped provide the basis for what is today the European Union. For this reason, Napoleon is often considered the father of modern Europe, and ever since him, the world was never really the same. To this day, Napoleon remains one of the most written about men in history, second only to Jesus Christ, inspiring masterpieces of music, art, literature and poetry, from Beethoven's stirring third symphony to Tolstoy's War and Peace. Few fictional characters have ever done as much as Napoleon Bonaparte. The so-called man of destiny and a mass of contradictions, Napoleon is still something of an enigma. Both a hopeless romantic idealist and the bitterest of cynics. The combination of his irresistible charm when he chose to deploy it, his iron will, workaholic habits, inspirational speeches and sayings, sheer intellect and of course his fiery temperament captivated or alarmed. To some he was a god, to others the Antichrist. And his meteoric rise and then crushing downfall has been compared to a Greek tragedy. After less than 15 years in power, in the last of seven wars formed against him by coalitions of European monarchs, Napoleon was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo and exiled to the remote rocky island of St. Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. At the end of his life, reflecting on his misfortunes, Napoleon's analysis was, I have too much ambition and a spirit of fire. This is the story of Napoleon and the dawn of a new age. Napoleon's conquest of Italy, and later of Egypt, made him a household name, cementing his self-belief and his powers of leadership. Most crucially of all, Napoleon was to take his first steps into diplomacy and European politics, founding states and toppling thrones, forging constitutions and exporting French revolutionary ideas. His early conquests paved the way for the foundation and character of his later rule and French Empire. Napoleon's Italian campaign was his debut on the world stage, taking command of a ragged army devoid of hope and transforming it into a victorious fighting force which in less than one year would defeat no less than six successive enemy armies despite the French being constantly outnumbered. Napoleon had now cut up two of their most formidable armies, each of them nearly three times as large as his own. After his latest victory at the Battle of Castiglione, Napoleon wrote to the Directory, The Austrian army has vanished like a dream, and the Italy that it threatened is now quiet. It had vanished, but not for long. Austria was bent on raising a third army, and Napoleon would have to begin the campaign all over again. By August 1796, the war between France's infant republic and the coalition seemed to be tipping in France's favour. In the Vendée region, 
General Hoche has just brought the three-year royalist revolt to an end, in a civil war that cost an estimated 165,000 lives and the bloodiest chapter of the French Revolution. Bourbon Spain allies with France, and the two countries will combine forces against their common enemy, Britain. Meanwhile, in Germany, the armies of General Jourdan and General Moreau have crossed the Rhine and are marching on Vienna. While in Italy, Napoleon's stunning victory at Castiglione had sent the Austrians scurrying back into the Tyrol. But the Austrian Empire still refused to make peace with France. It had virtually inserted on its banners, Gallia de Lenda Est, the French Republic shall be destroyed. The aristocratic governments of Rome, Venice and Naples, which had violated their faith and turned against Napoleon, were now terrified after his victory at Castiglione, anticipating vengeance. But Napoleon treated them with clemency, simply telling them that he was fully aware of their conduct and that from now on he would be watching them closely. Napoleon still maintained a healthy level of respect for his royalist opponents and frankly admitted had I been surrounded by the influences which have environed these gentlemen, I should doubtless have been fighting beneath their banners. He did, however, summon Cardinal Mattel, the envoy of the Pope, to his headquarters. The old Cardinal did not even attempt to defend himself. Instead, he bowed to the young victor, exclaiming, Pechavi, Pechavi! I have sinned, I have sinned! His dramatic contrition disarmed Napoleon, who jokingly advised him to do penance for three months with fasting and prayer in a convent. By contrast, the people of Lombardy's new republic had remained faithful to French interests, and Napoleon thanked them in an open letter. When the French army retreated, and the partisans of Austria considered that the cause of liberty was crushed, you, though you knew not that this retreat was merely a stratagem, still proved constant in your attachment to France and your love of freedom. You have thus deserved the esteem and love of the French nation. Your people, which is ever becoming more energetic, becomes every day more worthy to be free. Some day, without doubt, it will enter on the stage of the world with glory. Accept the assurances of my satisfaction and of the sincere wishes of the French people to see you free and happy. Another result of Napoleon's victory at Castiglione was that Josephine was now able to rejoin him at Brescia. But Napoleon was no longer there. He was waiting for Josephine at a newly established headquarters, over 25 miles away, and he had left instructions for her to join him there. Claiming the lateness of the hour, Josephine insisted that she was too tired to continue, and she decided to stay the night at Brescia. She was given the apartment that Napoleon had just left. After settling in, Amalan returned to her suite, where the table had been laid for a late supper and he was shocked to see that the other guest was none other than Hippolyte Charles. When the meal ended, the men made to return to their rooms. However, a languishing voice called Hippolyte back from the door. Later on, just before he settled down to sleep, Amalan returned to retrieve his hat and pistols he had left in the antechamber outside her bedroom. A grenadier posted outside the door denied me entry. I understood that the heroine of Peschera had reverted to the femme galante of Paris. Josephine rejoined Napoleon the next day, and they returned to Milan. Napoleon spent the next fortnight with her, and between and after battles, he found the time to organize a number of events for her and proudly showed her off to the Italians, to attend gala dinners, tour the main cities, where she paraded her endless Parisian dresses at fashionable balls. The most impressive of these was a grand ball given by the Duke of Serbaloni. The evening was attended by all the famous Milanese ladies, among them Madame Visconti, who arrived draped in a bandeau of red velvet, embossed with Viva Bonaparte in diamonds. All these beautiful women trying to catch her husband's eye made Josephine jealous, but they made no impression on Napoleon, who, according to one guest, established his position behind the chair of his wife and would address his conversation to no one else. After another fleeting reunion, Napoleon again had to set off for the front line. All his preoccupations and dangers could not, however, distract Napoleon from his love, which seemed to be ever increasing in intensity. Arriving, my beloved, my first thought is to write to you. Your health, your sweet face, has not been absent a moment from my thoughts the whole day. I shall be comfortable only when I have received a letter from you. 
I await them impatiently. You cannot possibly imagine my uneasiness. I left you cross, annoyed and unwell. If the deepest and sincerest affection can make you happy, you ought to be. I am worked to death. Adieu, my kind Josephine. Love me, keep well, and often, often think of me. But Josephine was in morose spirits. I hardly see Bonaparte at the moment. He is very occupied with the siege of Mantua. I am dying of boredom here, in the middle of the superb fates given for me. I never cease to miss my friends. The municipality treated me like an archduchess, and not like a republican. But the arrival of her friends like Madame Amelin helped keep Josephine company at the palace. More soon arrived in Milan, and the swelling Parisian presence caused shockwaves. Their immodest behaviour, as one newspaper put it, gave rise to some offence. Arms, chests, shoulders, all are uncovered. The arrangement of their hair is a scandal, sewn with flowers and feathers, and the whole crown with little military helmets from which tresses of untidy hair escape. They are so regardless of convention as to dress in tunics revealing legs and thighs, barely hidden by flesh-coloured stockings. Their manners match their clothes, arrogant talk, provocative looks, and meat-eating on Fridays. Josephine was soon swept up in the social world once again. I had hoped to get a letter from you, and I am terribly worried about you. You were rather ill when I left. I beg you not to leave me in such uncertainty. You promised me to write more regularly, and at that time your words were in harmony with your heart. You, to whom nature has given a kind, genial, and wholly charming disposition. How can you forget the man who loves you with so much fervour? No letters from you for three days, and yet I have written to you several times. To be parted is dreadful. The nights are long, stupid, and wearisome. The day's work is monotonous. This evening, alone with my thoughts, work, and correspondence with men and their stupid schemes, I have not even one letter from you which I might press to my heart. Think of me, live for me, be often with your loved one, and be sure that there is only one misfortune that he is afraid of, that of being no longer loved by his Josephine. A thousand kisses, very sweet, very affectionate, very much for you alone. As the days passed, Josephine began to give parties and dances, and graciously accepted the gifts of jewellery and works of art from the heads of the great Italian families, hoping that her influence might put them in her husband's good graces. The King of Naples gave her a pearl necklace, and the Pope gave his daughter in God a collection of antique cameos. As Josephine wrote to her aunt, I am fated wherever I go. All the princes of Italy give me parties, even the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Ah, uh, well, I prefer being a private individual in France. I care not for honours bestowed. I get sadly bored. My unhealth has undoubtedly a great deal to do with making me unhappy. I am often out of sorts. If happiness could assure health, I ought to be in the best of health. I have the most amiable husband imaginable. I have no time to long for anything. My wishes are his. He is all day long in adoration before me, as if I were a divinity. There cannot possibly be a better husband. It seemed it was slowly becoming apparent to Josephine what kind of a man she had married. Napoleon did not belong in the drawing rooms of Paris, nor did he ever want to, making small talk and trading gossip. But here, in the field, organising, directing and leading his men, he shone. The Italians were always prone to admiring a victorious general, and they hailed Napoleon as a Scipio, a Hannibal, a Prometheus, even a Jupiter. One Italian peasant, who wanted to marry a girl, but was forbidden to do so by his father, walked over 140 miles from Bologna to Milan in order to beg Napoleon to overrule his father's objection. Many Italians, recognising him as a countryman, regarded him not as a conqueror, but as a liberator, and whenever he appeared, enthusiastic cheers welcomed him. Bonfires blazed on every hill in honour of the places where he travelled, and the church bells pealed whenever he appeared, while long lines of ladies strewed roses in his path. The poet Ugo Foscoli wrote an ode to Bonaparte Liberator, and in one of his works he declared, Who would not want Bonaparte for legislator, captain, father, and for spiritual chief? According to Ernst Arndt, a young German writer visiting Milan, from Graz to Bologna, people are only talking about one person. Friends and enemies alike agree that Bonaparte is a great man, a friend of humanity, a protector of the poor and unfortunate. In all the stories people tell, he is the hero. They forgive him everything. 
except for him sending Italian works of art to France. But in doing so, Napoleon was not doing anything new. For the last several years, it had become a principle of the French Republic that works of art formerly belonging to kings, nobles and religious communities should become the property of the French people. The French revolutionaries elaborated a theory that, just as Rome had inherited Greek culture, so should the new Rome, the French Republic, repatriate art in a similar fashion. Of course, many ancient and medieval civilizations and kingdoms had plundered the countries they had defeated in battle and carried off trophies. Louis XIV and other monarchs had plundered Flemish and other art without needing a theory to justify it. While Napoleon was conquering Italy, the French were also conquering Holland, from where paintings had been sent to the newly opened museum in Paris, later to be renamed the Louvre, where they drew large crowds. And just the year before, over 400 paintings from the castles, churches and monasteries of Picardy had been seized. So the War Minister Carnot was doing nothing unusual when he wrote in May 1796, ordering Napoleon to send back works of art to Paris in order to strengthen and embellish the reign of liberty. Napoleon fulfilled these orders with exactitude and an eye for quality. He made a treaty with the Duke of Parma, who he allowed to retain his dukedom in return for an agreed indemnity. Among the items that Napoleon requested was Correggio's painting Dawn. A narrow-minded Republican may well have shunned this painting because it portrays the Madonna and Child with saints, and saints, according to some, had done as much harm as princes, but Napoleon took a wider view. The Duke did not wish to part with so lovely a work, and offered Napoleon a large cash sum instead, but Napoleon insisted on the painting. The million he offers us will soon be spent, Napoleon wrote to the directors, but the possession of such a masterpiece in Paris will adorn the capital for ages to come, and give birth to similar exertions of genius. Almost every treaty that Napoleon signed contained terms about works of art. Napoleon reported to the Directory, we will have everything that is beautiful in Italy, with the exception of a small number of objects in Turin and Naples. The Pope, for instance, was obliged to provide him with a hundred paintings, statues or vases, and Napoleon personally chose the two statues of the pioneer Republicans, Junius and Marcus Brutus. In Rome, according to the Swiss sculptor Heinrich Keller, the most beautiful pictures are sold for a song. The holier the subject, the cheaper. Mark Antony is standing in a kitchen. The dying gall is packed in straw and a sackcloth to his toes, and the beautiful Venus is buried to her bosom in hay. On their arrival in Paris a few months later, the Directory paraded these masterpieces through the streets, carrying a proud placard. Greece surrendered them. Rome lost them. Twice their fate has changed. It will not change again. Later on, in his conquests throughout Europe, Napoleon would continue this tradition and was advised by experts on what art to request. But the work sent back to Paris often reflected Napoleon's own tastes, like Galileo's manuscript on fortifications and Leonardo da Vinci's scientific treatises. The French also removed flora and fauna and took specimens of various plants and animals back to Paris's Jardin des Plantes. Napoleon even found some mercury for the chemist Berthollet to use in his experiments. But Napoleon remained strictly within the limits of his orders. In Florence, he had admired the Medici Venus and told the curator he would like to send it to France, but he had no power to do so, since Tuscany and France were at peace, and so the Venus remained where it was. Wherever he could, Napoleon also sought to minimise the damage and destruction of war. During the Siege of Mantua, he proposed that all artistic monuments in the town should be protected by an agreed flag. In Milan, he went to Santa Maria della Grazi to inspect Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Seeing the fragile condition of the fresco, Napoleon took out a pen and, resting a piece of paper on his knee, wrote an order that no troops were to be billeted there just in case they caused any damage. Napoleon made it quite clear that although born on the island of Corsica, he was a Frenchman and to emphasise that point, he had dropped the U from his surname before the campaign had begun. But he treated Italians, especially scholars and intellectuals, with a sympathy rare among educated Europeans. During the siege of Mantua, Napoleon had offered 15 scientists and writers passes out of the starving town. When he had given the French troops permission to sack rebellious Pavia, he spared the houses of all the university professors, including Volta and Spallanzani. Napoleon commissioned pictures and medals from the Milanese painter 
Andrea Appiani, and bestowed on him a house, requisitioned from the Franciscans, worth 40,000 Milanese lira. To Cesarotti, the translator Rossian, Napoleon gave a pension. To the town of Brescia, a fine telescope. Napoleon went to Piatole, where the Roman poet Virgil had been born, and declared the place free from taxes. Napoleon wrote to the sculptor Canova, then living in Rome, As a celebrated artist, you have a right to the special protection of the army of Italy. I have given orders for your board and lodging to be paid for at once. Academics were also impressed by Napoleon's abolition of censorship, though of course, it did not extend to criticism of the French occupation. France was la grande nation, but Italians could share in her grandeur. So when inviting Oriani, a writer and astronomer, to come to Paris, Napoleon wrote, All men of genius, all those who have achieved distinction in the Republic of Literature, are all Frenchmen, no matter where they were born. Men of learning in Milan have not enjoyed proper respect. They hid themselves in their laboratories and thought themselves lucky if priests left them alone. All is changed today. Thought in Italy is free. Inquisition, intolerance, despots have vanished. I invite scholars to meet and propose what must be done to give science and the arts a new flowering. All who desire to visit France will be received with distinction by the government. The citizens of France have more pride in enrolling among their citizens a skillful mathematician, a painter of reputation, a distinguished man in any class of letters, than in adding to their territories a large and wealthy city. Meanwhile, Napoleon was now free to resume his siege of Mantua, to finally drive the remnants of the Austrians out of Italy for good. But he had to start all over again. As soon as he had moved his troops away, the Austrians had dragged all 140 of his guns into the city and demolished his siege works. They had also replenished their supplies, as well as over 60,000 shot and shell, and received a reinforcement of 15,000 men. As Napoleon no longer had siege equipment, he could therefore only blockade the fortress. In summer, the pestilential marshes that surround the city were lethal, and the Austrian garrison cooped up inside was now being decimated by disease, mostly malaria. General Serrurier, commanding the French siege, also contracted the disease, returning to France to recover. Even General Massena asked to be replaced, citing ill health and exhaustion, but Napoleon was in desperate need of talented commanders and rejected his request. At any moment, the French were liable to have to face a fresh Austrian army. In the course of just three weeks, the Austrian General Wurmser found himself in command of 50,000 men at Trent. There were also 20,000 Austrian troops still in Mantua, giving him a force of 70,000 men. Napoleon had only received enough reinforcements to repair his losses and was again in the field with just 30,000 men, but surrounded by more than double that force. Despite this grave disadvantage, the Directory in Paris ordered Napoleon to attack as part of a grand strategic offensive against Austria. Napoleon is to break through Innsbruck, join forces with Moreau's Army of the Rhine, then together invade Austria and force Emperor Francis to sue for peace. Napoleon planned to use speed and concentration of force to fall upon the Austrians in the Adige Valley and clear the path northwards. His opponent, Austrian Field Marshal von Wurmser, was under immense pressure to relieve Mantua. He and his staff believe that recent fighting has left the French army shattered and incapable of offensive operations, so the Austrians plan to make their own advance. Rather than try to force his way past French troops in the Adige Valley, Wurmser decided to keep Davidovich in a defensive role, with 25,000 men, in a very strong position at Rovaredo, to prevent any incursions of the French north into the Tyrol or Austria. While he leads a wide outflanking march, with 30,000 men via the Brenta Valley and Bassano, following its narrow pass to try to relieve the blockaded fortress of Mantua. Once there, Wurmser would link up with the garrison and would then have an effective force of 50,000 men. And when Napoleon came south to face him, he would be caught between two Austrian armies, who could attack Napoleon from both the front and behind and cut his army to pieces. But in coming up with this strategy, the Austrians had once again made the mistake of dividing their forces. 
as one British colonel who was serving with the Austrian army observed. I doubt if Bonaparte had had command of the Austrian forces, he could have contrived it better for his own purposes. The Austrians began their advance on the 1st of September. The next day, the French forces begin their advance. Massena pushes up the Adige Valley, with Augereau taking a tougher, more mountainous route on his right. General Vaubois marches around Lake Garda to join them, with one brigade crossing by boat. Rushing double time up the valleys, the French hardly took one moment for food or rest. The first Austrian outposts are driven back, and by the fourth, three French divisions are converging on Davidovich's heavily outnumbered force, which had been left behind in the north, near Roveredo. Vamza was too far away to help Davidovich, on whom Napoleon was about to pounce. At dawn on the 4th of September, at the Battle of Roveredo, the French burst like a tempest on the surprised Austrians. General Victor leads the main attack straight up the road, driving back the enemy centre. Meanwhile, French light infantry swarm up the sides of the valley to outflank the enemy, a tactic the French will use again and again to force the Austrians out of strong positions in the narrow passes. The battle was short, bloody and decisive. The Austrians were routed, and the French cavalry pursued them, gaining 7,000 prisoners and 20 cannon. Napoleon would always regard this as one of his most brilliant victories. The remains of this Austrian corps retreated far back into the gorges of the mountains. They are driven up the valley, towards Davidovich's main camp at Caliano. As Napoleon remarks, this position should have been impregnable. Sheer mountains, either side of a valley floor that's only a few hundred yards wide. A small castle and wall add to the formidable natural defences, but its defence has been left to a single, shaken Austrian regiment, which is given no time to repair. When the French hit them with speed and numbers, they give way. Massena's troops break through to the main Austrian camp, where soldiers, expecting a much longer respite, are preparing dinner. The arrival of the French sparks chaos and confusion. The Austrian escape route is immediately jammed with fleeing troops, wagons and guns. The French round up 3,000 prisoners, alongside 25 guns and 7 standards. Next morning, Napoleon entered Trent in triumph, issuing a proclamation to the people of the Tyrol, assuring them that he was fighting not for conquest, but for peace that he was not the enemy of the Tyrolese people, and that the Emperor of Austria, incited by English gold, was waging relentless warfare against the French Republic, and that if the people of the Tyrol would not take up arms against him, they would be protected in their persons, their property, and in all their political rights. Napoleon then invited them to arrange the government of the country for themselves, and administer their own laws. Napoleon had thought that he faced the whole Austrian army around Trento. But now, speaking with prisoners and locals, he learned that Wamsa and half his army had set off down the Brenta Valley. With typical speed and decisiveness, Napoleon tore up the original plan to join Moreau at Innsbruck and instead ordered a pursuit of Wamsa. If he could catch and destroy Wamsa before he reached safety, the war in Italy would be won. As he reported to the Directory, On the 8th I shall be at Bassano. If the enemy waits for me, there will be a battle, which will decide the fate of this whole country. When Wormser receives news of the fiasco at Cagliano, his troops are, unluckily, already strung out along the Brenta Valley, with his vanguard approaching Vicenza. Wormser orders Davidovich to hold the passes north, assuming they are Napoleon's objective, and pushes on to Mantua. But Napoleon is no longer going north. He orders Vaubois to pursue Davidovich and keep him blocked in, while Augereau's division leads the rest of the army down the narrow, funnel-like Brenta Valley to catch up with Vamsa and his 30,000 men and take them by surprise. The army of Italy is brimming with confidence and momentum and marches much faster than the Austrians. That march of 60 miles was accomplished with a speed that no army had ever attempted before. One discontented soldier stepped forward from the ranks, called out to Napoleon, and pointing to his tattered uniform said, We soldiers, notwithstanding all our victories, are clothed in rags. Napoleon replied, You forget, my brave friend, 
that with a new coat, your honourable scars would no longer be visible. This well-timed retort earned cheers and applause from the ranks, and his word spread like wildfire through the camp. A small Austrian force at Levico offers token resistance before it retreats and hurtles down the Brenta Valley. The troops on both sides have by now begun to feel that Napoleon was invincible. The French were elated by constant victory, while the Austrians were disheartened by uninterrupted defeats. The next day, French light infantry route a 3,000 strong Austrian rearguard at Primalano, taking most of them prisoner. Eager to intercept Wormsa before he relieved Mantua, Napoleon had advanced far beyond the main column of the army. He'd eaten nothing all day and had not slept for several nights. A soldier happened to have a crust of bread in his knapsack, broke it in two, and offered his general some. Then, wrapping himself in his cloak, Napoleon threw himself down on the ground next to the soldier for an hour's rest. In a decade's time, Napoleon, then Emperor of France, was making a triumphal tour of Belgium, and this same soldier stepped from the ranks of a regiment which he was reviewing, with the words, Sire, on the eve of the Battle of Bassano, I shared with you my crust of bread when you were hungry. I now ask from you bread for my father, who is worn down with age and poverty. Napoleon immediately raised him to the officer rank of lieutenant and granted his old father a pension. Bewildered, Wormsa tries to gather his army as quickly as possible and decides to make a stand at Bassano, where the valley opens out into flat plains. With Colonel Lanz leading the charge, the Austrians are driven back, then chased into town by Murat's cavalry. During the battle, Napoleon detected a fault in the movements of the enemy and was on the point of taking advantage of it when a private, covered with the dust and smoke of the battle, sprang from the ranks and exclaimed, General, send a squadron there, and victory is ours. You rogue, where did you get my secret? In a few moments, the Austrians were fleeing for an impetuous charge of the French cavalry. When the army needed every possible inspiration to fight, Napoleon exposed himself to so much enemy fire that one pioneer, seeing his peril, demanded, Stand aside! Napoleon stared at him and did not move, and so the veteran thrust him back, saying, If you are killed, who is to rescue us from this jeopardy? He then placed himself in front of Napoleon, shielding him from the firing. After the battle, Napoleon ordered the pioneer to be sent for, and placing his hand on his shoulder said, My friend, your noble boldness claims my esteem. Your bravery demands a recompense. From this hour, an epaulette instead of a hatchet shall grace your shoulder. And the pioneer was immediately promoted to the rank of officer. The Austrians were again defeated, and Wormser, with just 16,000 men remaining to him, fled the scene. Napoleon also asked about the young private, who had shown such tactical promise. But he was found dead on the field. A bullet had pierced his brain. The dead would have to be left unburied, as not one man could be spared from pursuing the Austrians, to give help or even a cup of water to the wounded. The moon rose in the cloudless sky, and Napoleon, as was his custom, rode over the battlefield, which was still covered with bodies. The silence was only disturbed by the occasional groans of the wounded. Suddenly, a dog sprang from underneath the cloak of his dead master and ran over to Napoleon, whining as if asking for his help, and then rushed back again to the body, licking the blood from the face and the hands and howling. Napoleon was deeply moved by this scene and stopped his horse to contemplate it. The image stuck with him. Many years later, he recalled, I know not how it was but no incident upon any field of battle ever produced so deep an impression upon my feelings. This man, I thought, must have had among his comrades friends, and yet here he lies, forsaken by all except his faithful dog. What a strange being is man, how mysterious are his impressions. I had, without emotion, ordered battles which had decided the fate of armies. I had, with tearless eyes, held the execution of those orders in which thousands of my countrymen were slain, and yet here my sympathies were most deeply and resistlessly moved by the mournful howling of a dog. Amid panic, chaos and blocked roads, the French take another 2,000 prisoners, including an Austrian general and 30 guns. 
Napoleon spurred on his horse to keep up with the pursuit of the Austrians, and with only a few members of his staff, entered a small village well ahead of the main body of his army. Suddenly, Wurmser, with a strong division of Austrians, debouched on the plain, and one peasant woman told him that just a moment before, Napoleon had passed her cottage. Wurmser, desperate to obtain a prize which would make up for all his losses, sent his cavalry in every direction to try to capture him. He was so sure of success that he strictly ordered them to bring him Napoleon alive. It was only the speed of Napoleon's horse that saved him. Wurmser is in disarray, down to 12,000 men, outnumbered two to one, with part of his force accidentally retreating in the wrong direction towards Trieste. Now, Wurmser's only hope is to reach Mantua. The French and Austrian armies are in a race to that fortress. But for the first time in the campaign, Austrian soldiers outmarch their exhausted French counterparts. Wurmser leaves a small garrison at the fortress of Legnano to slow Augereau's pursuit. Forging ahead, Massena manages to block the Austrians' path at Chiria, but Austrian General Ott makes a determined attack and clears the road, taking 700 French prisoners and seven guns, in a rare defeat for Massena. With the help of a local informant, Wurmser then finds an intact, unguarded bridge across the Tione River and reaches the outskirts of Mantua on the 13th of September. His army has been saved from destruction by the skin of its teeth. Napoleon has failed to prevent Wurmser from reaching Mantua, but he knew that if he could bottle him up inside the city, it would put incredible strain on Mantua's supplies and its ability to hold out for much longer. For that reason, Wurmser was desperate to keep his army outside the city walls, free to maneuver and, crucially, forage for supplies in the surrounding countryside. The next morning, as Augereau accepts the surrender of the Austrian garrison at Vignano, Massena tries a surprise attack at Due Castelli, but it's overambitious. His men have not had time to recover from their long march, and the Austrians fight bravely. The next day, Napoleon launches a much larger, coordinated attack. Saguier's division advances on the right. His troops are soon in heavy fighting with Ott's brigade around the Villa La Favorita. Augereau's division, under temporary command of General Bonn, advances along the Mincio River, trying to turn the Austrian right flank. When Wurmser sends reserves from his centre to strengthen both flanks, Massena's concealed division launches its own attack. Heavy fighting rages on the outskirts of Mantua for much of the afternoon. Finally, Wurms' centre begins to crumble, and the French take San Giorgio. Much of the Austrian right wing is now cut off. Many are forced to surrender, while others flee into the lake. With the Austrian line shattered, Wurms orders his men to fall back to the safety of Mantua's citadel. Wurms and the fragments of his army, the same troops who were meant to have rescued Mantua, were now prisoners, trapped inside the very place they had been sent to relieve. Napoleon then ordered the siege to be resumed. In this short time, 10 days of campaigning, Napoleon had destroyed a third Austrian army, more than twice as large as his own. Meanwhile, Napoleon returns to Milan, sending his aide de camp Marmont to Paris to present 22 captured Austrian standards to the Directory. Napoleon had by now been working 20 hours a day for weeks on end. When not galloping on his horse, he was meeting with Italian notables, his generals and his soldiers, visiting and comforting the wounded, dictating directives and orders, and writing to the directory every day, often several times a day, to report on the developing situation and his predictions for the future, and to ask for reinforcements, indispensable to the survival of his army, which now seemed to be essential to the survival of the Republic itself. Napoleon himself was on the brink of exhaustion. He caught a fever while camping in the marshes near Mantua, which made him so frail that the army grew alarmed at his condition. His hollow, pallid cheeks at this time inspired the emigres to joke, he is of a most beautiful yellow, while they drank to his speedy death. 
Napoleon's troops often amusedly contrasted their little corporal with the flamboyant and swaggering Murat. But they could forgive him this, and seemed to love him all the better for it. While Napoleon was in Milan one morning, just as he had mounted his horse, a dragoon rushed over to him, carrying important dispatches. Napoleon read them on the saddle and gave him a verbal message, telling him to take it back as quickly as possible. I have no horse, the dragoon explained. The one I rode, due to forced speed, fell dead at the gate of your palace. Take mine then, Napoleon replied, dismounting. The man seemed hesitant to take, the magnificent horse of the Commander-in-Chief. You think him too fine an animal, and too splendidly caparisoned. Never mind, comrade. There is nothing too magnificent for a French soldier. Incidents like these, which occurred often, were retold around the campfires, and were slowly giving Napoleon a degree of popularity, amounting to adoration. Gaining Napoleon's approval had become his army's greatest joy. Two battalions that fought bravely Napoleon presented special flags, made of fine taffeta silk, with the red, white and blue of the Republic. Instead of battle honours from long-forgotten wars, Napoleon inscribed the silk with new battle names, Lodi, Alcola and Rivoli. If he spoke a word of praise to a regiment, they had it embroidered on their banners. I was at ease, the 32nd was there, was on the flag of that regiment. On the 18th, brave 18th, I know you. Over the 57th, the terrible 57th, which nothing can stop. Another of Napoleon's innovations was to award Damascene swords to the hundred bravest men in his army. He also took special care to commemorate the fallen and ordered part of the Milan Cathedral building fund he'd set up to be used to build eight pyramids, which were to be inscribed with the names of the fallen French heroes. Napoleon's displeasure was an even greater stimulus than his approval. Discipline was one of the key reasons for his success. With his lawyer ancestry, Napoleon insisted that his officers issue a receipt for everything they requisitioned, be it a box of candles or a sack of flour. If his soldiers stole or damaged, he arranged compensation. He strictly forbade looting, to such a degree that he once ordered a French grenadier who stole a sacred chalice from the Papal States to be made an example of for breaking this rule the soldier was shot in front of the army. Napoleon also had to fight to clean up his army's supply corps. Though living in a rich and fertile country, the army contractors were so greedy and dishonest that food reached the men half spoiled and in meagre quantities, while the clothing supplied was simply shoddy. In letter after angry letter, Napoleon condemned the crookedness of army suppliers, who sent him nags fit for the shambles instead of cavalry charges and who stole everything from medicine to bandages. I'm surrounded by thieves here. I've already had three commissars, two administrators, and a number of officers court-martialed. Napoleon had no patience for these men, and when one of them tried to make him a gift of fine saddle horses, hoping that he would close his eyes to embezzlement, Napoleon snapped, have him arrested, imprison him for six months. He owes us 500,000 accused in taxes, the positive counterpart to discipline was incentives to bravery. Napoleon gave promotions only to the brave, and the brave of the soldier, the greatest promotion. Murat, for instance, a fearless cavalry officer, rose from the rank of major to brigadier general in just two months. Napoleon's impact was just as potent on his generals. There was so much of the future in him, was Marmont's expressive phrase. A remarkable set of men became Napoleon's followers and friends, Augereau, Massena, Berthier, Marmont and Junot, many of whom will be with him for years to come. More perhaps than any other commander-in-chief of this era, the young Napoleon held the high view of his soldiers as patriots and citizens, not just as men-at-arms. They were the carriers of the revolution, as well as defenders of their homeland. Napoleon's proclamations to his army shared the glory with his soldiers and projected onto them his own confidence in destiny. Napoleon grasped, as few have done, the meaning of esprit de corps, and the glory that flowed from success in battle would, for many of his soldiers, prevail even over their feelings for their families, with many even coming to love him over the years, more than their own wives and children. 
What the ancient writer Plutarch says of Caesar and his legionnaires might be said of Napoleon's mastery over the army of Italy. Those who in other expeditions were but ordinary men displayed a courage past defeating or withstanding when they went upon any danger where Caesar's glory was concerned. Napoleon's constant references to the ancient world had the intended effect of giving ordinary soldiers a sense that their lives, and should it come to that, their deaths in battle, mattered, and that they were an integral part of a larger whole that would resonate through French history. In the art of leadership, there are few things harder to achieve than this, and no more powerful impetus to action. Napoleon taught ordinary people around him that they could make history, and convinced his followers that they were taking part in an adventure, an experiment, an epic, whose splendour could draw the attention of posterity for centuries to come.